They tend to dismiss the red flags in the narcissistic relationship. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com and of course from UnderstandingAutoimmune.com where you can find over 460 plus and growing episodes of the show. And I'm so excited tonight. We have a return guest, Pi Venus Winslow, and she talks about codependency and narcissistic abuse. And let me read her bio because she's awesome. She's one of our popular returning guests. And it's a topic that I think many, many people with autoimmune conditions and other chronic diseases have at least a little bit in their background. So let me read her bio to you. Pi Venus Winslow is a published author, public speaker, and transformational life coach for those recovering from narcissistic upbringing. Pi's mission is to empower others to reclaim their authentic selves and live intentionally free from codependency and narcissistic abuse. So maybe a few of you are like going, oh yeah, that rings a bell either with me or with someone I know. So welcome, Pi. Thanks for coming back on the show. Oh, thank you so much, Sharon. I'm so happy to be here again. Oh, we get lots of questions and comments on the topic and when you're with us. And uh, just if somebody hasn't seen the previous shows, let's just go over what is narcissistic abuse first, and then we'll just find codependency before we jump in with our new questions. Yeah. So there's a condition called a narcissistic personality disorder, and it is an extreme disorder. It's a mental disorder. It's in the manuals for mental health. And there are, there are many traits of this kind of personality and there's a huge long list. So I'll try to just highlight some of them for people who may be curious about those narcissistic traits. Mostly it's a lack of empathy and a lack of remorse, a lack of empathy for other people and a lack of remorse for treating other people unkindly or taking advantage of other people. Exploitive relationships is one of the hallmark signs of narcissistic tendencies. Narcissists have also an inflated ego and a sense of entitlement and they're, they very much need attention and energy from other people. They want acknowledgement. They want attention. They want to be seen in a certain way. They have grandiose ideas about who they are, which doesn't necessarily match up with their behaviors. They tend to have arrogant behaviors. They tend to be jealous and envious of other people. They can be passive aggressive. They will omit and deflect the truth to look good, to maintain an image about themselves. They react very poorly to criticism. They lack accountability for their behavior. They're very controlling and manipulative of other people. They can create drama and they're easily offended. And when they are offended or when they get angry, that they may be being exposed for their poor behavior, they can go into something called narcissistic rage, where they will attack other people for exposing their agenda. Wow, that was a long list. And it's a spectrum, I shall I say, or a bell curve. Maybe you know some people with some of those tendencies, and maybe you know people with all of those tendencies. But I certainly can raise my hand when I think of several people in my world who fall into several of those categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And many people have these traits. We can all we can all exhibit some of those behaviors from time to time when we're not being our best self, when we're triggered, when we feel threatened, when we're afraid people can exhibit some of those traits. But a person with narcissistic personality disorder is on the far end of that spectrum, has become their personality. It is the way that they operate from day to day in all kinds of situations. Other people tend to recognize that these are not healthy or appropriate behaviors and they work on not engaging in them or changing them or adjusting them 
and becoming better people. That's the difference between somebody who's making mistakes or not having their best day or triggered or whatever is going on with them going through a challenging time because we're humans and and we do want to protect ourselves and and those are all protective behaviors for the narcissist but people who don't have the disorder are capable of changing their behavior and becoming better people but people who have the disorder they don't see any reason to change they're really invested in the identity that they have created for themselves and that they project out into the world and they will protect it at all costs. Wow. Okay. Now from the outside looking in, I'm just off the top of my head thinking that, okay, why would someone else from the outside be attracted to that? And I think that's where this codependency comes in because some of the things you said, I'm like, okay, <laughs> that sounds scary, or I'm not sure that they would make the best friend or more. So I'm thinking of like a, a, a bee to a flower or a butterfly to a flower or something like that. Let's talk about what is the attraction? People who have severe narcissistic traits and behaviors, they don't show that side of themselves off the bat they very easily make themselves attractive to other people and connect with other people. They can be very charming. They can be very flashy. They can be very charismatic. They can be very friendly, very complimentary. So that's the more, what's the word I'm looking for? It sounds like camouflage to me. <laughs> it is camouflage. It, it, they absolutely camouflage. So they're going to look for what it is when they meet another person, they're going to look for what the other person will connect with. And then they will assume that role. So they study people and they try to figure out how other people work. And then they make themselves what other people are looking for. If if you're easily impressed by flashy people, uh, compliments, uh, you eat that kind of thing up, attention, then if a narcissist takes that role on with you, they'll use that to draw you in. Other kinds of narcissists are more covert and they will use your empathy, your pity to pull you in. So they they have a sob story. They'll they'll share that with other people to get the, the other people to feel sorry for them, to connect with other people. It also helps for uh, people who are engaging with covert narcissists to share their vulnerability. So it sounds like the narcissist is sharing theirs, telling you their their sob story, and then you will empathize and tell them your your pain and they're they're taking notes of that so that they know what buttons to push with you to manipulate and control you but that comes later the same thing with the more overt narcissist they'll love bomb the love bombing is really like pouring it on really thick lots of compliments gifts showing up doing things attention communication and all of that happens and then over time once the person gets invested the target of the narcissistic abuse gets invested in this relationship then the narcissist starts playing with the power dynamics and testing to see how hooked in the other person is so they'll start to manipulate the relationship to start gaining control. The target becomes enamored with the narcissistic person, then they'll start compromising. They'll start making compromises and concessions. And then the narcissist can turn up the manipulation by actually starting to become abusive. This brings up a couple of things for me. And one of the things that just popped into my head was a rule I adopted years ago <laughs> after being exposed to a narcissist or two. And I remember whenever my friend said, what is it about so-and-so? And then I, 
out of my mouth would come, you just don't understand. I'm telling you, that was, I learned the hard way. That was my warning signal <laughs> the next time. If that came out of my mouth, my friends understood far more than I understood that I was having to make excuses of, for whatever I was doing in this particular relationship. And I found that to be really helpful to have that as my, okay, if that comes out of my mouth, that's my early warning sign that I need to at least take a step back and, and uh, take off the rose-colored glasses and take a nice hard look at whatever's happening. Absolutely. That's actually a really good indicator to step back. And so I think what happens is that the narcissist becomes so attractive to the target that the target just starts to well, if they, and especially if they have codependency traits themselves. And so if anybody who grew up in a childhood environment where they experienced manipulation, control, abuse, neglect, they're already in a sense preconditioned to have codependency traits. Because when we're children, we need to bond with our parent and it's a survival mechanism. It's it's in our DNA. Because if we lose our parent, we will die. We need our parent to take care of us completely for the first 18 years of our lives, at least, right? We need to be attached to our primary caregiver. And so if our primary caregiver has narcissistic traits or abusive traits, then we adapt to continue to maintain that bond. And so that attachment, a healthy attachment is having a healthy relationship with your caregiver. But if your caregiver wasn't a healthy person and your relationship with them was challenged, then you're going to have a maladaptive attachment style and that's going to carry over into your adult life. So our caregiver or parent is our first love relationship. It's where we were nurtured, we feel safe, we get affection, we are, we're validated, we're seen, we're heard. But if that doesn't happen in your childhood or it's inconsistent or warped in a way, we look for those same qualities in other people, not consciously though. So I think the problem is that growing up in it, not knowing any different, we think it's normal. Exactly. That's their normal. And that's just to me a generalization of this idea of if you're raised in it and that's how you are, and that's all you're exposed to from birth, sometimes what your normal is is not what other people would classify as normal. And there's a difference between normal and healthy in what we were talking about. So if your normal is an unhealthy relationship, an unhealthy dynamic with a parent or a family system or a, a partner or a love interest or a job, a, a coworker, a boss or a friend, then that might be normal to you, but it's not necessarily healthy. So if you grow up with unhealthy being your normal, then that's going to be familiar to you later in life, but it's not healthy. Oh, good point. Yes. And the word appeasement pe keeps coming into my mind when you're describing this codependency dynamic power, narcissistic power, especially in a family system, whether it's a parent or a spouse or something like that. It, it sounds like the codependent or the person without the narcissistic tendencies is doing a lot of appeasement trying to please the other person. Absolutely. Yes. People pleasing is a hallmark trait of people with codependency. Agreeableness and people pleasing. There's many other traits. Perfection, perfectionism, needing things to be perfect, needing to have other people think we're perfect, that we're a good person. So we're also, in a sense, concerned. And I say we, because I'm talking about myself here too, because I've struggled with codependency because I grew up with an alcoholic father and a narcissistic mother. So I'm, I am perfectly primed 
for narcissistic relationships. And my work on myself, my personal development work is around codependencies, people pleasing, perfectionism, looking good, being acutely aware of other people's emotional state while disconnected from our own emotional state. I would say codependency in one brief description, one sentence or one word is overinflating the value of others while diminishing the value of the self to the point of self-abandonment. That can take place over time in any relationship. I can see very specifically that if you're from birth, you're almost set up in a way to have that as an adult. Uh, in your own story, if you'd share, what was the moment where you went, oh my goodness, maybe I'm codependent or something. I'm just wondering, like, where is that point where someone has those moments of this isn't working? I'm just curious about, are there moments where people are like, okay, I'm done or, oh, okay, this isn't working? <laughs> So people who have codependent traits have a tendency to swing from one extreme to the other. So yes, codependents are some of the nicest people in the world. They're, they're very caring. They're very empathetic. They're very generous, very giving, and they, they want attachment to people. They want relationship with people. And, and that's a good thing, but to an extreme which is to the point of neglecting themselves, really losing themselves in relationship with other people, where over time, the relationship, all their focus is on the other person and they lose focus on themselves. And then the other side of that is when, when codependents get hurt, they go to extreme behaviors to protect themselves. And a lot of the time, their frustration with the relationship and the fact that they're neglecting themselves, they turn that inward onto themselves. They can develop addictions to deal with the pain of self-abandoning. They could develop eating disorders. They struggle with maintaining healthy relationships with themselves and other people. The self-abandonment really causes a lot of pain and frustration for codependents because they believe that by pouring themselves into the relationship with the other person, they become dependent on that other person to make them feel good about themselves. So instead of taking care of themselves, they're almost wanting the other person to take on that responsibility. And that is where the dependency takes place. And that puts the power in control of somebody else. So somebody else is now in charge of your happiness. I love the topic. I'm fascinated by the topic. I'm thinking about multiple ways that there are certain traits that I'm relating to myself and other people in my world. Do you have any tips if somebody's going, it's resonating, but boy, this sounds scary and fear starts to come up when somebody like, okay, having to admit that perhaps they've abandoned all or part of themselves. I'm wondering about how that moment of awakening or aha, this is, there's might be a better way. Uh, what happens? Is there a way to help someone through that or help ourselves through that? There are ways to heal from codependency. In my opinion, it is really about reclaiming your authentic self. It really is about finding who you really are and feeling good about who you are and developing a deep sense of self, knowing yourself, accepting yourself, forgiving yourself, loving yourself, and protecting yourself. If I grew up with a narcissistic parent, how would I know who I am, I guess, is my thought. That would seem pretty overwhelming to think about, okay, I'm hearing a lot from Pi about, I'm checking the box, it's going, oh, could be, could be, could be. Yet we were talking about it was their normal. I'm not sure if you've never experienced something, it's hard to know what the other side is, right? Or am I extrapolating this wrong? 
I think codependents have an idea of what the other side is. It's just that there's been a dependency on other people to provide that. So codependents know how to feel joy and happiness. They have felt that, but they haven't learned how to generate that so much for themselves. Many codependents, they have these deep internal struggles. They have low self-esteem. They have low self-worth. They live in a lot of fear. They live in fear of judgment, rejection, conflict with other people. They tend to be confused and have brain fog. They're disconnected from themselves. They have a scarcity mindset. They're afraid that they're not going to get their needs met. Worthiness issues, a victim mentality. They often have unprocessed or prolonged grief and they can slip into depression and sadness. But when they're in relationship with somebody who shines the spotlight of love on them, like the narcissist does, they experience a, a great high. They experience being loved. They experience being seen. They experience being appreciated. And that's what they wanted. That's what they've wanted all of their lives. So that's a hook. But they tend to dismiss the red flags in the narcissistic relationship. When the narcissist starts like squeezing and like turning the vice, so to speak, or in the example of the frog in the hot water and you start turning the water up really slowly and you don't realize it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter, the codependent is wishing for what they had in the beginning. So they're doing everything they can to get back those really good feelings and that closeness and that safety and that security that they had in the beginning of the relationship. So to conquer codependency is to recognize that we don't need to be dependent on other people to have good feelings about ourselves. When we learn how to love ourselves and we can connect to our values we can change our belief systems in our own mind, then we can start experiencing self-love and self-generated attention, care, and we can look at relationships as an extension of what we've already developed inside of ourselves. And we can evaluate those external relationships and determine if they're healthy relationships, if they're good for us. So I always say to people who are recovering from codependency, we've got to give relationships adequate time to develop. We can't put all of our eggs in the basket the first week, two, three weeks, three months of getting to know somebody because we haven't really seen we haven't really seen how that person behaves or responds when conflict comes up, when disagreement comes up. A couple of people in my world where I'm thinking about when they get in relationship, all their other friends, including me, tend to not hear from them anymore. Yeah. And it's only when they're out of relationship that all of a sudden the friends pop back into their world. I pop back into their world. It's, oh, I haven't talked to you in a long time. And I can almost always guess, oh, she's uh, out of relationship again. That sounds like that's probably what's happening. And it could be a number of things. So naturally, when you get into a, a romantic relationship, that person is going to be high number one priority. That relationship, you're going to be putting a lot of time and attention into. And I think that's normal. But narcissists tend to want to isolate their target from everybody else. A red flag would be if the narcissist is showing jealousy or anger or frustration or disappointment in the fact that you have other interests and you have a life besides them. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about conquering codependency. It means finding who you authentically are and having boundaries around maintaining your identity. Just be, because you get into a relationship with another person does not mean you should abandon who you are 
and become what you think that person wants to make the relationship work. My goodness, this is multi, multi layered here. And I can see how, as we realize or have come to that place where we have abandoned ourselves, I'm thinking of all the neurobiology experts we've had on the show and how those self abandonments here in this codependency narcissistic relationship seem to play right along with the lines of the, our neurobiology and our autonomic nervous system and our personal safety connection. Uh, I'm no scientist. This is just the science of sharing talk in here community. But I can see a connection there where we could begin to, if we've abandoned ourselves, either not take care of ourselves or our bodies talking to us and saying, hey, over here, over here, and we're not listening for whatever reason. I could see how this could play into uh, ill health or the beginnings of ill health. Absolutely. Absolutely, Sharon. People who are codependent develop autoimmune diseases. It's, it, the self-abandoning literally manifests as our bodies attacking, attacking ourselves because codependents internalize everything. Codependents believe those deep beliefs of not being worthy, not being good enough, and desperately needing that validation, that love, that the identity from outside of ourselves will develop a very self-critical voice inside of us. And we will abuse ourselves. We will abuse ourselves in our own mind, and we will abuse ourselves sometimes in the choices that we make mm -hmm. externally. And I think that pattern of turning all of our frustration and anger at not getting our needs met from the outside, we turn all of that inward and we blame ourselves, then we're literally contributing to the breakdown of our body system. And it affects our body, absolutely. It affects our mental health, our emotional well-being. It affects our spirituality, our spirit. When we come back, everyone, I'm going to talk to Pi about what are some of the first steps we can take to unravel all of this and the types of things that she teaches in her workshops and her courses and her coaching. So we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And tonight we're here with the amazing Pi Venus Winslow. And she's a published author, public speaker, and transformational life coach for those recovering from narcissistic upbringings, as well as codependency and learning how to be free from codependency and narcissistic abuse. Now, Pi, this is a very deep topic, and I know we're just scratching the surface, and I'm sure a few people are going, hmm, there are little bits of reminders here of maybe that could be me, or a part of me is really going, hmm, pay attention here, <laughs> this is important. But it does sound overwhelming in a way. I know you give amazing workshops and courses and coaching on this. What are a couple of the first steps you take people through so they can begin to at least have the few moments of awakening where they're like, oh, I get it now. Because sometimes, as I said, when you're especially a narcissistic parent, it may be hard to really see yourself in the lens of non-codependency. The way that I start working with people on conquering codependency is the I, it, I've broken it down into three phases. And so the first phase is the release phase. And the release phase focuses on how to recognize these patterns that we are in that are the codependent patterns and to release these patterns because they they hold us back. They, they keep us from living a healthy life. They keep us from being healthy. They keep us from having healthy relationships and really taking advantage of all of the possibilities and the opportunities in life. Instead of self-sabotaging and self-abandoning, we get to look at these patterns so that we can determine what the real reason is that that we are stuck in these patterns. And what we end up doing is identifying the codependent programming. And it is it is our belief system. 
and letting go of this programming that no longer serves us. The way we do that is we work through a lot of things. And part of this process is recognizing that it's not our fault if we have these patterns or we have these belief systems. They came from experiences that we had when in the past and those experiences had a profound impact on us. And we felt our survival was threatened in some way. And usually that's that attachment. Keep in mind that their brilliant strategies to survive a dysfunctional system, family system, or dysfunctional relationship, but they don't work over the long haul. They're not sustainable because those kinds of relationships cause a lot of stress in the body. We get to look at attachments. We get to look at what we needed and we didn't get. We get to look at how our thinking is flawed around a lot of things. This reminds me of Sarah Payton's topic. One of the first times we had her on, and I remembered it so clearly. She said from the neurobiology educator part of herself, she said, there are two things that people are always looking for, and it's, am I safe? And if once they answer that question, the next question is, do I matter? Yes. And it sounds like we're having to reevaluate from our earliest memories, perhaps, maybe even that far back, and finding our own way to create a new type of safety and a, and a new type of mattering. Is, yeah. matter, is mattering a word? I don't know. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. It's significance. That's a basic human need is a need for significance, a need to matter. It's it's worthiness. So yes. A release from fear. I, I, I think this idea of I'm, I'm feeling unsafe and then maybe on top of that, I don't feel like I matter. To me, as I'm just replaying in my head, if that was me, I would be going, that's coming from a place of fear. Yes. Yes, it's coming from a place of fear. Recognizing that a lot of the time when we don't feel safe, we're telling ourselves or we're making assumptions about things that aren't really true. We're actually remembering things. The way our brain is designed is we learn something and if we have a negative experience, our brain remembers that it puts it at the top of the list so that in the future, we can avoid that. Yeah, I don't want that. I don't know what I, I want, but I don't want that. I don't, I don't want that again. So that's in a sense how we learn. And so we have a tendency to think if we grew up with our, if our parent withheld love and affection and attention from us in a way to discipline us, then we can be afraid that that will happen in our adult life. But we don't recognize that we're adults now. It's almost like we regress into a childlike state thinking, if this person that I love takes the love away from me, I won't survive. And we're not anchored in the reality of the present moment, which is for me, I'm a middle-aged woman with an education and there's no reason why I couldn't survive without this other human being. I might feel sad that the relationship is over or it doesn't work or I need to let it go because it's not healthy, but I'm not going to die. That's fascinating. I'm thinking of some of my communications training and my conflict resolution training. And one of the things that comes to mind here is the concept of that if someone's behavior, and I'm thinking you could recognize this in yourself, but if someone's behavior seems to be odd, or you're like, this is unusual, oftentimes people have regressed to their teenage years or their childhood, and they're not in the present moment anymore when these things are like, that's unusual behavior for this person. And so I could see that that would be a red flag for myself to internally recognize, okay, am I regressing in this moment? And is that helpful? That's what a trigger is. And that's what P that's how PTSD works. A PTSD is when a current stimulus happens and our brain takes us back to that moment in the past that was traumatic. 
And I don't want that anymore. And I'm thinking that's happening right now. So PTSD can happen from a traumatic event that happens once and it's a very severe traumatic event, or it can be complex and it could be a pattern over time. The second phase of, of, the, of recovery is like really reclaiming your worthiness. So once you identify your patterns and you choose to let them go, what do you have left? You've taken your old identity, your old regressed identity, and you've let that go. It's a scary space to be in because you're like, now I have this empty space. Who am I? To find out who you are, you get to reclaim your authentic self. You reclaim your worthiness. You connect to your values. You connect to, instead of what you don't want, what you do want. And really seeing where these parts of you that you've had to abandon, you get to bring them back. If you were taught that children should be seen and not heard, maybe you lost your voice. Maybe mm -hmm. you don't speak up. So you get to reclaim your voice. You get to start learning how to speak up. But you've got to know what to speak up about. So you've got to know what's important to you, what your values are, what your boundaries are, what your responsibilities in life as a healthy human being are. Recognizing how our thinking patterns work, really understanding your biological organism and starting to practice self-love and self-care on a very, very high level and learning to trust yourself. Learning to trust yourself, learning to like yourself, learning to get to know yourself, right? Like, what do you enjoy? And being okay with who you are, accepting yourself and practicing positive thinking, practicing a positive mindset, starting to set up things in your life to support you, training yourself to change your perspective instead of seeing the world as a scary, dangerous place where you're not safe to I'm intelligent enough and I'm, and I'm setting myself up to keep myself safe. I'm becoming aware that I can make different choices to keep myself safe. That sounds like a tall order, although the outcome or the final solution, the place that you're going sounds so enticing that I can see how it builds on itself from step one to step two. We're just about down to the last 10 minutes. I want to make sure we have time to frame for everyone what step three is, and then obviously talk more about your book and the workshops that you give because I think they're vitally important. I'm sure a few hands are going up. Mm, codependency, yeah, could be. Yeah. At least exploring whether it is you or not. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So once you release and once you reclaim, the last phase, the final phase is this is the phase where you start taking action to actually rebuild your life the way that you want to live it. This is where we focus on strategies that help you navigate and negotiate relationships with other people because codependency is, it's a relationship pattern. Once you let go of what doesn't work, you find out who you are, how do you go out into the world and be who you are in relationship with other people and not lose yourself again? So this is the phase where I teach people essential skills to be a healthy, confident adult, people can finally start living their lives free from codependency and narcissistic abuse. I teach people tools and strategies and ways to manage their triggers. We're all going to get triggered. Those triggers, sometimes they do go away, but we've got to learn how to manage them first. And then we can start to become desensitized to them. I teach them how to interrupt their patterns, practice self-soothing, and learning how to see life and relationships themselves and other people through an objective assessment to really understand the difference between thoughts and feelings. Because when you're codependent, they're all mashed together and they're all a big tangled mess. And that's why codependents are so confused all of the time. When you understand the difference between thoughts and feelings, 
the confusion clears up really, really quick. Another mentor came to my mind as you were describing parts of step three. And one of the things he taught me years ago, and this was around learning con communication skills and team dynamics, things like that. But he said the time from noticing the error that you made and doing the right thing or changing, and this was in communication styles, so in your nonverbals, your body language, but it makes sense. It applies to life in my mind. During the time you go, oh, I did it again, to the time that you uh, self-correct, shall I say, maybe that's not the right word here, but for me, that's what we're going with here, gets shorter and shorter. That means you're making progress. It isn't an overnight thing. It, you said, you'll notice that you, oh, I did that hand gesture again. It's not a helpful hand gesture. And then when it becomes, oops, and fix, <laughs> readjust in within that same really short few seconds there, he said, then you finally integrated it. This process of changing, transforming yourself, it does, it does absolutely take time. But like you said, with practice and support, and moving through that process, yes, it becomes easier and easier and easier. It's like changing any habit or learning anything new. You've got you've to gotta learn it. You've got to figure out how to apply it. You've got to practice it and then fine tune it. And then suddenly like it's working, you're doing it and it becomes more and more natural. And those are the moments I love when I've been working on something, whether it's a belief, a pattern, or just one of my hand gestures. But those are the moments I live when all of a sudden you're like, oh, I did it right. Or I did it the way I've been wanting to do it right first time. <laughs> yes. And I always uh, give myself a little internal pat on the back. Bravo, you did it. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is how we build confidence. You can't just go out and get confidence. It's not out there anywhere. It's through the action of doing that you become more used to what you're doing. You become more successful at what you're doing and it feels more comfortable and you're seeing the results, right? You're seeing, hey, I got through the day and I didn't do that behavior or I got through the day and I didn't have those troubling thoughts or I got through this interaction with another person and I resolved the conflict and I didn't I didn't self-abandon or I didn't act out or I didn't do something that was my old pattern. I remember years ago I was trying to change a specific pattern and it was around boundaries and I went to an event where that happened, the interaction happened, and I set a boundary. And I was internally, I was like so happy with myself that as I was leaving the event, I gave myself an old high five. I just went, yes. <laughs> and somehow it's locked that boundary in my mind now is somehow, as I said, the pat on the back or the high five that went, yes, the fist pump, yes, really locked it into my brain of, oh, you can do it. Absolutely. And it is a mindset shift in recognizing that we are capable and we are capable. Codependents are very, very capable. They're very resilient. And like I said before, the way our brain works, we remember the things that don't work. They're high at, at the top of the list. But when you start recognizing all of the good things, all of the progress that you're making, everything that you've been through and start seeing, hey, I am capable. I can change things about myself. I can get better. I can do better. I can learn things. I can be successful. When you start focusing on that, that builds your momentum. Life starts to get exciting and your life changes and it gets better. And that is the evidence and the promise of recovery. We'll have to, of course, I say this every time, Pi, time flies. We'll have to have you back on for some more in depth, but I want to have time to talk about your workshops and your courses, and then also your website and your book. That's a big, big order there. Okay. I do offer group coaching. I have a program called the Conquer Codependency Coaching Program, where I take people through these three phases of 
conquering codependency. And you can take any phase at any time by itself, depending upon what you want to focus on. I recommend doing the whole program in order from phase one to phase three. Some people may Ha may be more interested in one of those phases than the other, you can always go back and pick up the other ones. You can go to my website to the Learning Center to learn about those courses on, on my website, which is fullvenusrising.com. You could also find my website by putting my name in Pi Venus Winslow, and it should come up in your search engine searches. And I have a gift that I would like to offer your listeners today. Fantastic. So I would like to offer your listeners a free digital copy of my book, which is called Mother Medusa, Weaving Myth, Ritual, and Magic into Healing from a Narcissistic Upbringing. And in that book, I describe my experience growing up with a narcissistic mother and how it impacted me and how I changed and transformed my life. And I teach, this is what I teach other people, is how to change and transform their lives, to conquer codependency, to live as their authentic self, and intentionally free from recreating these dynamics in relationships with other people where they get into toxic relationships or they're continually victimized. And so the Conquer Codependency Program is a great way to get started on your recovery journey. And I do offer specials, discount promotions for getting into that program. So you can go to my website and check it out. FullVenusRising.com, everyone. That We'll have that in the show description as well. But it is Full Venus Rising, just how it sounds, <laughs> .com. And it's an awesome program. And I do really thank you for offering the book for free. It's a powerful book. It's so helpful and had so many aha and insight moments. And it was fantastic. It's definitely a read and you can't beat the price, everyone. So go over to fullvenusrising.com and get your copy of the book too. And check out a Pi's programs. And thank you so much for sharing with us again, Pi. I always enjoy seeing you and listening to all your wisdom about conquering codependency. And everyone, have a great week, whatever your adventures. Join me next week for another brand new episode. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes.